Person says, "Some such reaction." This is <clears throat> Israel invades Lebanon and is hit by Iran's missile attack. What the fuck? Uh, this is the recent thing that happened. Uh, there was always like question, like, is Israel Lebanon going to be at war? What's going to happen with the Hezbollah and things? Right? I'm pretty sure. And yeah, uh, you know, they attacked the leader of Hezbollah. I'm pretty sure, like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that was the case, right? And I'm, I'm not following the news that much, but like, I, obviously, breaking news, you kind of hear about it. So I, I don't think I've, you know, watched or read uh, Middle Eastern news, uh, you know, uh, in detail. So this is going to be first video since a long time. So it's going to be interesting, like, where things are heading. Uh, is, is it slowing down? Clearly not. Uh, you know, like, uh, things are escalating. But is there any sign of, like, things slowly, like, coming to, uh, like, a, let's just say, agreement? Or, like, uh, something that might slow down or just looking to escalate? Because this is clearly escalation, right? Israel, Lebanon now is at war. There you go. Official war. So, like, Israel is fighting two wars now, apparently. Uh, or the same war, how you want to look at it. But yeah, it's just like increasing, right? Uh, the more and more it increases, the more tensions rises. Like, who knows where that's going to go. This is the task and purpose, obviously. Like, he's always, you know, the, one of the first creators who makes a detailed video about it. And he's like really good at it. So yeah, it's going to be interesting. Let's do it. Israel launched a ground campaign inside southern Lebanon to push Hezbollah fighters back while Iran has reportedly just fired off a barrage of ballistic missiles back at Israel in retaliation as war escalates in the Middle East. I'm going to do my best job to give you the information that you need to arm yourself in order to. What about this time though? Last time when Iran launched a lot of missiles and like drones, 99% was intercepted. Did that happen today? Not today, this time. Was U.S. involved this time? What happened? Better understand what we might be observing and where we could be headed in the future. It's my goal to help clear up some of the fog of war that we're witnessing right now. On September 30th, 2024, Israeli special forces launched targeted raids directly across the border. Their objective is to, I believe, pave the way for a larger ground campaign, most likely, that'll be made up of conventional forces. Behind me is a live conflict map of the border between Israel and Lebanon. Now, this open source intelligence tool helps us connect reports from news agencies and government officials to geolocated specific sites on the map. As you can see, most of the blue markers here are towns that the IDF has advised to evacuate, which gives us some indication as to where the next phase of this war will be fought. The scale of this assault might actually be a lot larger than these reports make it sound, though. According to the IDF themselves, they committed about one whole army division, which in Israel that numbers about 10,000 soldiers. The way the term special forces is used in the IDF and the way that it's reported in the mainstream media is a little differently than how it's used in the US military. Israel's called up four reserve brigades, each with 2,000 soldiers and up to 100 tanks. They've also deployed their 36th, 98th, and 91st Division, which suggests to me that they could commit at least 40,000 soldiers to the assault. These are seasoned combat veterans, many of whom spent the last year fighting inside Gaza. The main job of these troops for the IDF will be to find and destroy. Hold on, so that means the Gaza thing is over now? Uh, so they're, they're easing back of Gaza or just like diverting uh, troops? Like they have more, so they're diverting. Is that what's happening? Hezbollah anti-tank guided missile teams so that a follow-on larger mechanized push can safely move in. This is because there are a handful of roads that connect Israel to Lebanon, through which main battle tanks and troop transports can travel through. There's a very limited amount of places that they can assault through with armor. This initial ground assault is designed to clear those limited choke points and gather intelligence on Hezbollah fighting positions to call in airstrikes. The conditions for the regular soldiers on the ground for both sides of this fight is going to be difficult. This is because oftentimes your visibility is going to be limited by forests and buildings in these different towns. That means this battle will be fought at close proximity, oftentimes within 100 meters and below. This isn't going to be necessarily a artillery duel. It's not a tank on tank skirmish. These two forces will be up close and see each other with the naked eye. 
The IDF is pushing in and clearing homes that have been used by Hezbollah as outposts and fire positions. They're also clearing out expansive, sophisticated tunnel networks that the organization has built up over the past 20 years and that they've used to safely transit the region. And if you want to take the IDF at their word, they claim that Hezbollah has been planning to storm. Yeah, IDF is clearing homes that might be associated with Hezbollah. I don't know why it feels weird. That, that sentence feels like uh, effed up to me. Because I'm pretty sure a lot of them might not be associated with Hezbollah, but they're just going to clear it because they think it might be the case. Let's just say Israel doesn't have the great track record of like just like having that kind of accuracy. So yeah, a lot of people might get screwed because they perceive that might be related to Hezbollah or something like that. 3,000 of their soldiers across the border here in something called Operation Galilee, where it was going to be like an October 7th style attack, except they were going to use these tunnels on the northern border. Hezbollah's retaliation so far, it's, it's been surprising. It's been limited to about 30 rockets on the first day that were fired into Israel, which is kind of a shock to me. I remember that during the 2006 war with Hezbollah, they managed to fire off on average about 100 rockets per day throughout the conflict. And this is one of the ways that we use to anticipate how Hezbollah is performing. It's been a metric that has been used for the last few decades. This is an early indication to us that some of Israel's actions over the last two weeks may have been effective in causing chaos for Hezbollah. I'm looking at you, beepers and walkie-talkies. I don't even know if my freaking microwave is safe anymore. However, that was insane. Like the beeper thing, that really made me think, how the fuck did, did they do that? So yeah, I guess like Israel has been like effective in things like that. Like they must have taken on really key uh, people at Hezbollah. So it's like, uh, if your organization is not working effectively because the people who are making it effective is no longer there. I mean, yeah, so those beepers, you know, like pagers things that exploded, right? Uh, taking out leaders and like important, uh, you know, like key players, key players, key people from like, uh, that, you know, Hezbollah and things. So yeah, it must have like, you know, like disrupted the whole operations of them, right? Like what to do, when to do, like being efficient that way. Hezbollah's spokesman, Mohammed Afif, said that this initial rocket fire was quote unquote, only the beginning. While these ground incursions are international news right now at the moment, the truth is that the IDF revealed very recently that they started raids all the way back last year, right after October 7th attack took place. The IDF's elite commandos for the past year have been secretly conducting at least 70 cross-border raids where they stayed inside Lebanon for multiple nights at a time. This phase that already occurred was really the limited small scale targeted strikes that paved the way for the larger scale movement that we're currently observing. When I cover difficult topics like this, things are always subject to change, even an hour after I post it. So for more updates as this is happening live, follow me at Cappy Army on Instagram. The link's in the description, and I can show things on there that I'm not able to show here on YouTube. These targeted raids were originally designed to allow Israeli residents to return home but the IDF claims that they were unable to achieve this objective. By, by small, I mean that they were on the scale of two squads of 20 soldiers and up to a platoon size raid of about 40 guys. What we're currently seeing on the other hand appears to be a division sized assault of thousands now. Now, what we're talking about is a military concept known as shaping operations. Shaping operations refer to any actions that you take to establish the preconditions for success in future missions. It's like when you wake up in the morning and you brush your teeth. That's a shaping operation for your day. Shaping operations have been going on here, it appears like, for the past entire year. Israel did not want a repeat of what happened in 2006. And by the morning of October 2nd, geolocated reports were coming in of exactly where these firefights were taking place between Hezbollah and the IDF. Hezbollah reported they were engaged in clashes at the town of Morun al-Ras. The second spot is here near the town of Adesha, where the IDF penetrated 400 meters deep and then they withdrew. 
So a key military concept that'll make more sense of that is known as operational tempo or op tempo. Op tempo is the speed at which an operation is conducted. Fast op tempo is more risky, but it's designed to overwhelm the enemy's ability to respond effectively and throw them off balance. Keeping a high op tempo would mean that we would see Israel attempt to advance quickly to prevent Hezbollah from regrouping. However, what I think we're seeing is a more slow op tempo where they're engaging and then disengaging and withdrawing, which is a little bit less risky and slower. So what we're observing right now is yeah, basically high tempo just implied like what Russia tried to do <laughs> with the Ukraine didn't work. Basically uh, what Germany did, Germany did most of its World War II, uh, you know, times with the wars and things, right? Like just surprise attack, be fast. Right, just like, uh, you know, before anybody can do anything, just like surprise them type of element. It works, but you really need to be sure. It's like a very high stake thing. Because if you're not sure and you fail, like that, you, you're going to be screwed basically. And with slow tempo, just basically there's going to be more structure to it. I guess it makes sense. Uh, so yeah, after seeing what happened with Russia and Ukraine, I'm pretty sure most people are going to like try with slow tempo and less risky thing. Because if you do it, you know, fast like that, like you could go anywhere, right? You don't want to be caught into something like that. Was that this limited ground invasion or ground assault is already itself a follow-on mission from the raids over the past year that we barely heard about. Over the past year, Hezbollah has fired about 11,000 munitions into northern Israel from inside Lebanon, and Israel has conducted 8,000 airstrikes in return. There are a lot of headlines that say the region is bracing for wider regional war. And whenever I see that, I always wonder, well, what does that really mean? While it's possible Egypt and Jordan could join in in a fight against Israel, it's pretty unlikely, and Syria really has their hands- This is just insane, man. Talking about unstable region. Middle East, un Middle East is unstable. Middle East is unstable. Everybody says that all the time. Now look at it now. It's really unstable, right? Wars are like just increasing. More people join, basically most of the Middle East will be at war. At this point, I wonder like how, how don't they have more lead there than cement? Every time they destroy buildings, they build it back up, the, the buildings get destroyed again. This is just insane. I'm not gonna lie, if I were living in places like that, I would try any, any means, I said, even if I were to take a dinghy boat out and go somewhere else. Because this is just insane. Any bullet can fly anywhere. Any missile can fly anywhere, right? There are more bullet holes there than anything else. That's insane tied with a rebellion, so what I think they're really worried about is what Iran ended up doing next. On the morning of October 1st, the Wall Street Journal and other publications were already reporting intelligence that Iran was preparing a ballistic missile strike. This information was coming directly from senior U.S. intelligence officers. The signs that U.S. intelligence look for when determining if Iran is preparing for a strike with ballistic missiles is by looking at changes in satellite images of known- <laughs> Literally looking at them how does us prepare for if, how does us know if iran's gonna do that they literally look at the missile silos wait a minute wait a minute i see i see it's opening look at the, the silos opening oh okay they're gonna attack that's that that's how much us is gonna flex we literally have eyes in the space looking at you launch sites that are near tunnel bases there they are likely reporting visual signs of mobile launchers being moved into place Somewhere at the CIA, there is an entire floor dedicated to playing Where's Waldo with Iran's ballistic missile launchers. By Tuesday, October 1st, in the afternoon, Israel- <laughs> The guy drinking coffee, whoop, 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 they're, they're moving there, they're moving there, everybody just like red alarm starts like, oh, look at that, Iran's gonna attack. ...reported that Iran had, in fact, launched missiles at them, likely targeting three of their bases north of Tel Aviv. Initial reports indicated Iran had fired off 100 ballistic missiles at Israel, but by early October 2nd, it became more clear clear what happened, Iran fired off roughly 180 to 200 ballistic missiles. The reason this is significant is because it's a pretty big increase from the 120 that they fired in April. They also used more sophisticated versions. They moved quicker. So Iran said that they, the reason that they did this was in retaliation for Israel assassinating Hezbollah's leader Nasrallah, but my personal opinion is that they most likely did it as retaliation for Israel's ground campaign into Lebanon. My personal opinion and analysis is that Iran learned from their first missile attack, sending drone waves the first time was meant to overwhelm Israel's air defense. But 
All it really ended up doing, I think, was give them six hours of warning to prepare. This time around, by only sending ballistic missiles with this new strike package, Israel had only between 12 and 17 minutes before the missiles got there. Although realistically, we know they had at least six hours to prepare because US intelligence spotted signs that the launch was imminent earlier that morning. Most of these missiles from Iran have a circular error probable of between 300 and 500 meters accuracy. So what that pretty much means is that 50% of the missiles will land within 500 meters of where they aim. Three U.S. destroyers that were stationed off in the Mediterranean fired off interceptor missiles. Iran claimed that 90% of their missiles hit their targets. Am I sure about that? No, definitely not. But I recommend checking out Habitual Line Crosser if you want expert analysis on how air defense works. Video evidence on the ground does show at least a dozen of Iran's ballistic missiles or more impacting on the ground. Now the question is exactly how much damage did those impacts cause and what did they hit? The air bases that they aimed at were in arid desert unpopulated terrain and there's a huge difference between hitting material assets and hitting dirt. Although even successfully hitting ground does score some kind of like psychological warfare point, so to speak, it's important to note the way Israel's Arrow air defense radar system works is it calculates if the incoming missile will land in a populated area or not, and then it only fires an interceptor missile if it's an actual threat. On the other hand, they also could have been overwhelmed by the speed of the munitions. The Iranian government immediately claimed that they destroyed 20 of Israel's F-35 fighter jets. This story was then carried and circulated by many outlets. Whether or not they really did, there's actually no way Iran could have known that so quickly. There are concrete reinforced hangars that the F-35 are kept in, which can withstand a direct 500 pound bomb. And here's geolocated footage that does show evidence of the strikes hitting the base, but we don't know where. Last time eight missiles hit the base and they were ineffective. Evidence that the U.S. warned of the attack like six hours prior. Damn, that's insane. Imagine if they actually destroyed it. That would be some like blow to Israel, right? Wait a minute, do Israel even use his F-35s? Like, they have F-35s. They could literally do like, uh, you know, deep, uh, you know, like operations, uh, and, like destroying key areas and things using F-35s. F-35 is that good. The stealth is that good. Like... Before anybody knows it, like they could just go, you know, like turn back or something. Are they actually using it? Like they, they, you know, invaded Lebanon, right? Did they actually use F-35 to destroy key places and things? Like if they're not using, what's the point of F-35s at that point? And the fact that Israeli tanker refueler aircraft were already in the sky tells us that the Israeli F-35s were probably already in the air as well to avoid these hits and to intercept the missiles. My point though is that Iran couldn't possibly have done battle damage that quickly to know either way. I was lurking around on Preston Stewart's Twitter page as one does, and I saw people were still speculating about the battle damage because it was cloudy on October 2nd, so satellite images couldn't confirm or deny it. But there is an information war that's being fought right now all over the internet. And if some people believe those Iranian reports, if even a few thousand do, that's a W for Iran, that's a win. But the battle damage assessments are coming in, and it appears like one missile missed the Israeli Mossad intelligence agency building by about 500 meters. Another missile killed a Palestinian man, which is terrible. Watching that footage, which I saw on X, was it was awful what happened to him, and it makes me sick. Another missile hit a school. Israel reported no cow. Yeah, I just I just got like, oh my god, is he gonna so show it here? Yeah, this is YouTube man. I'm glad he didn't. Casualties for the strikes. However. When we look at it from the perspective of Iran and its allies, they also view this as a big win. And this might come down to a difference in mindset, I think, or culture. If I were to put myself in the shoes of Iran and do some red cell thinking, in the West, people like me, we love to quantify everything, how numbers, how many missiles destroyed, how many planes. But if you're in Iran and its allies, the very fact that they retaliated and bombed Israel and that many of their ballistic missiles got through Israel's often highly touted air defense network, this is a victory in and of itself for some people in the Iranian government. But if the missiles didn't cause any casualties, the attack that occurred right before did, seven people were killed and 16 injured in a shooting in Tel Aviv. We're not sure which group exactly they were linked to yet. What? That just happened hours ago? This is like a coordinated thing, right? They wanted to create chaos before they launched this missile so nobody can prepare for it. That must have been the case, right? If it was just a few hours ago. 
and yeah the missile thing like yeah last time 90 plus percent of them got intercepted so if it, even a half of them went through this time that's a victory for them because for them they might as well think we're not just going against israel we're going against us at this point if us are the one who's like defending against all this right it's always like us and allies basically you know defending against like missiles and drones so even if half went through they can like flex look at that even they have us with them half of them got through and but one of the attackers was killed and the other captured. And this just shows the myriad of different threats that Israel faces right now. The prospect of wider war in the Middle East should be horrifying to us all. There's always going to be clickbait, alarmist titles out there designed to get you terrified. And those types, they always have a point. That's the thing. Because World War III could certainly start tomorrow. But I think there's also kind of a limit to how far the escalation... That's the thing. I've been saying that in a lot of videos. We say World War III. If, is this point where World War III starts? Is this point where World War III starts? Thing might move so slowly. Like, World War th we might not even be able to pinpoint where the World War III started, but it might have done. Things escalate just enough to do that, right? Like, Middle Eastern war is, like, rising up. Multiple countries are, like, joining up. Like he said, like, even more might join. Ukraine Russia thing is not slowing down. Who knows? Like if uh, you know more people join that as well. Slowly, slowly. Oh, by the way, this feels like a world war. Okay, by the way, more people are gonna join. Enough people have joined, and enough damage has happened. This is gonna affect every single country on the planet. So that's a world war. Like yeah, uh, we assume like you know that saying like World War Three is gonna be so devastating. World War Four is gonna be fought with stick and stones, and we just assume World War Three means instant nukes. Everybody dead. Let's play Fallout with Death Claws. Prob might not happen there, right? World War III might as well be just like another intense war when nobody actually uses nuke because everybody afraid of it, right? And just like war just escalates from there. Like damage happen, people die in l large numbers just like World War II. And yeah, slowly, and it might be slow, right? Like it must stretch a long, long time before we can really understand the damage. That's the fucked up thing about it. We might not be able to pinpoint where it started and where it's heading can go here unless the u.s gets dragged in i think that's the real thing to keep an eye on while there is a fear of this escalating to wider war there are also certain limitations currently for how far this could eventually go for example iran would not be able to launch a ground invasion into israel and vice versa israel just doesn't have the manpower or the military capability to project power and launch any kind of ground campaign against Iran that's two nations away. That doesn't mean, though, that there still aren't dangers. The United States potentially getting dragged into the conflict would be one terrible situation that we could see happen in the future. Syria is unlikely to attack Israel because many of their forces are already committed against domestic rebellion, although technically and legally they are still in a state of war with Israel ever since 19... Yeah. U.S. <laughs> coming into, like, <laughs> war might be problematic. Yeah, it'd be problematic for everyone. Who knows whether it's going to escalate. But if the next election come and, like, George Bush becomes president again, Iran and everybody should know where that's heading, let's just say. Mission accomplished. This banner is coming. There you go. War is starting, right? Iran should fear that, basically. 48. They never signed a peace treaty in over 75 years. But what about the United States government? What are they doing? Well, for their part, they've signaled that they will do everything within their power to help protect Israel with fighter jets firing anti-air missiles against these Iranian munitions. So over the past two weeks, month really, we've seen the US military has moved additional fighter aircraft and Marine infantry units on board landing ships to the region. But the US already has at least a squadron of attack aircraft stationed at an airbase in Jordan. This includes the USS Abraham Lincoln Aircraft Carrier Strike Group is also in the region. Altogether, we're talking about over 100 U.S. fighter bombers and interceptors that are made up of a mix of different F-15s, F-16s. And earlier in August, in fact, the United States even sent 12 of their advanced F-22 Raptors to the Middle East, a likely station inside Jordan. If we do see a Iranian That's wide need, scale right? attack on Israel, it's likely we would also see a wider scale retaliation from Israel 
against targets inside Iran. The first thing that jumps out to me, though, is just how different this ground campaign is compared to the 2006 fight against Hezbollah. Before the ground attack even took place, Israel had effectively wiped out Hezbollah's leadership in targeted assassinations. Whoa. However, Hezbollah's deputy secretary, General Naim Qassam, attempted to wave away any concerns that might happen to be there in their rank and file troops by saying in a speech that they were ready to continue combat operations against the IDF in the face of these losses. Hezbollah will most likely give battlefield promotions to lower ranking members to fill in these gaps. There are four main- That's the thing, you can't just replace people, right? I, I, don't, I don't know where that mentality comes from. People just think that like, oh, we'll just replace them, how? Right? If somebody's like battle-tested veteran and like a, at a general position, and if, if that's eliminated, who, you can just replace that with some kind of a rookie or something, some green guy, right? Oh, by the way, figure shit out. Like that, that's right. I'm pretty sure Japan faced similar situations in World War II where they just like depleted their veterans. That's, that's never good. I didn't know Israel eliminated a lot of like command structure from Hezbollah. I just thought like they just attacked the, the leader. That's it. They, they systematically like eliminated a lot of like people in, in the command structure. That is something, right? And as far as the Iran thing, right? But like I said, Israel could use something like F-35s uh, to attack inside Iran to key strategic places like I don't know missile silos and uh, wherever um, you know like there could be a threat, right? They could uh, target key places using F-35s basically crossing points that I was able to find between Israel and Lebanon, and this is where the IDF has concentrated and massed over a hundred of their Merkava main battle tanks. The first crossing point is the Rosh Hanika, which is the main official crossing point, but this one is more of a civilian crossing point monitored by the United Nations, and my understanding is that it's less used for military incursions. Then there's the town of Metula and Kariat Shimona and the Elion Valley. Sorry for mispronouncing those words. I can't say them right even when I look them up because of my dyslexia and I just can't say it. Historically speaking, these areas are where cross-border raids first occur. As of October 2024, it appears as though the IDF has withdrawn all but a few thousand soldiers inside Gaza, down from a height of roughly 40,000, and they've since redeployed their resources to the northern border over the past few months. The main natural geographic boundary to pay close attention to is the Latani River. This river runs parallel to the border, and it's kind of a natural dividing line that the IDF has used in the past to try to advance to. It's located about 20 miles north of the border, and it's likely where the IDF will attempt to push Hezbollah back to, to what they call a buffer zone. That's a war goals, right? All the way to Roman time, like even Alexander the Great, like natural things like rivers and things is like natural borders, basically. People can use that. Even like Ukraine-Russia war, like with the Kursk offensive, like they're using things like that, river and things. Zone. An IDF spokesperson called for Lebanese people to evacuate all the way to 30 miles north of the Latani River, but Israeli officials told the Wall Street Journal that this incursion's goal right now into Lebanon is to only go three miles deep and not all the way 20 miles to the river. Although I'm sure there's some of you out there watching right now who are very skeptical of what the IDF has to say. 20 miles basically puts the Israeli communities and residential centers outside the range of much of their mortar fire and lots of their smaller rockets, and it limits the accuracy and choice of weapons that Hezbollah will have. According to the IDF, their main war goal here is to return the 60,000 Israeli residents who have been dis displaced by the fighting, they haven't been able to go home for the past year. On the other hand, and Hezbollah has stated that their goal is to prevent Israel from moving deeper into Lebanon, and they say that they're fighting in part on behalf of the Palestinians in Gaza, who over a million were displaced there. Another aim of Hezbollah's would be to prevent Israel from occupying and securing southern Lebanon. It's important to keep in mind, though, that there's also an estimated 200,000 Lebanese citizens in the south who have been displaced for the past year as well. Something on a lot of people's minds is the fact that Israel did invade Lebanon and go all the way to the capital of Beirut back in 1982 when they had a war goal of defeating the PLO in detail. Those people would say, how do we know Israel's not going to do the same thing again? As far as the timeline goes, it took the IEF approximately one month to reach this line of advance back in 2006, 
from the start of major ground operations as a point of reference. But between them and the river are some of Hezbollah's most well-funded and trained units. This is Hezbollah's Red Wan unit. It's their special forces of which there's an estimated 6,000 fighters. Red Wan's strategy is to use defense in depth. What that means is they're going to fire rockets, anti-tank guided missiles, machine guns from prepared positions. Then they, when they start to take too much harassing fire from Israel, they will likely fall back to a series of new defensive lines that they will have prepared over 20 something miles back to the river. Their capabilities that this unit often showcases is their hit and run tactics facilitated by dirt bikes and ATVs that allow them to quickly traverse the landscape. They're armed with high cut military helmets, ballistic body armor, and they're now kitted out with sniper rifles with suppressors. The unit has received hundreds of millions of dollars annually from Iran. They're better funded and equipped than Lebanon's actual army that their government has. They have enough cool guy gear to make boogaloo boys blush. A whole of that. Yeah, I didn't even thought of that. Lebanon's own army. Yeah, like there's also that, right? Well, that's something, right? Like when Hezbollah is more funded than the, your country's army itself, like which is the real army at that point, right? Like who holds the more power? Like, well, yeah, like 2006 might be different compared to now. Like Aaron might have like uh, advanced Hezbollah a lot with the, you know, like that kind of like investment and things. And there is always going to be an edge if you if you are the one who's defending. Right, so it's their land. They know their land, right? So they they can defend it easily. So yeah, it might not be the same situation like it was in two thousand six or something. Like you keep month, you know, like Israel can just in a month take over that that many places. That might not happen this time. Boys blush. All this is to say, although the IDF has indeed scored a series of stunning successes over the past few weeks, Hezbollah should not be underestimated. The IDF, those troops are walking into a heavily mined and well-defended region with between 30 and 50,000 Hezbollah fighters, according to open source estimates, with 150,000 rockets, missiles, and small arms. This estimate has recently been lowered, though, from old reports of around 100,000 fighters, so it believed that Hezbollah may have been overestimated in some cases. To soften the ground assault for the past two weeks, the Israeli Air Force conducted more than 1,600 strikes across southern Lebanon. Almost their whole tanker refueler fleet appears to be in the sky right now, possibly helping refuel aircraft to stay loitering above targets, looking for opportunities to strike. One of the main lessons the IDF said that they learned from the 2006 war with Hezbollah was better coordination and communication between ground forces, infantry, and close air support in the sky. This initial phase of the war plays to the IDF's strengths, which is long-range artillery, airstrikes, and targeted raids. However, the second phase, the conventional push with that armor that is needed to dislodge Hezbollah is going to be more vulnerable to anti-tank munitions, to getting bogged down by ambushes. This is the more complicated phase. The hilly terrain is advantageous to defenders because it provides brush and vegetation to hide in. Many people think the Middle East is just this flat, arid desert, but this region here in southern Lebanon is actually lush with forests. A Lebanon army has reportedly withdrawn from- Yeah, come on, man. Middle East is flat terrain, really? Like- that's not true of anything but yeah like that kind of like obviously mountainous area is always going to be easy to defend that's the whole thing of them right like there's a reason why well, like kings and like emperors of the past always like kept their castles and forts on top of a hill so hill is always advantageous right it's like uh you know higher ground and like everything like better to hide by the way, that thing, like, where they're just hiding below a building and they just suddenly come out and, like, launches a missile type of way. How, how the fuck you prepare for something like that? So, there, there might be a lot of things where IDF might get, like, suddenly surprised, right, trying to attack things. So, like I said, things might have changed a lot since last time they invaded Lebanon, right? Uh, because they might have, like, with Iran's hundred million, uh, you know, like, dollars and things, they might have prepared like this time if like Israel invades, like we're gonna surprise them type of thing. So it's gonna be interesting how it happens. From their positions on the southern border to avoid being pulled into the war. That's right, Lebanon's actual army is separate from Hezbollah. The 10,000 United Nations troops from 15 different countries that are also staying here right in that region are- 
the hell? What is oh. Okay. The Indian troops are also there. S Spanish troop, of course. Huh. Interesting. I'm, I'm, I was even surprised. Like, I recently, uh, you know, learned uh, somewhere, like... There's many places that are like, wait a minute, Indian troops were involved there? Okay, I didn't see that coming. But yeah, that happens a lot. We're also staying out of the fight. These UN soldiers, their mandate is basically to report any violations of Hezbollah back to the UN Security Council. Their mission is to essentially observe and report, not necessarily to fight. Israel has conducted a shockingly effective airstrike against Hezbollah's leader, Nasrallah, who has been in charge of the organization since the 1990s. Over the past 20 years, my point here is that Israeli's Mossad agency has been focusing all of their resources on Hezbollah. They developed a plan to be able to hit Nasrallah whenever they wanted. So eight F-15s from Israel's 69 squadron were each loaded with about six American-produced 2,000-pound GBU-31 bunker-busting bombs, and they dropped their payload over the city of Beirut. Exact details of the attack vary from source to source. It appears like Israel used about 80 to 85 bunker buster bombs provided by the U.S. on one single location to burrow deeper and deeper into the earth to hit Hezbollah's deeply buried and well-protected underground headquarters. Some of these underground facilities are more than 100 meters deep, which is typically out of range of even the larger 30,000 bunker buster bomb. Interesting ramifications for Iran's underground, deeply buried nuclear facilities, if you ask me. It calls into question whether or not they're really safe. We're going to continue following this as it evolves. If you appreciated this kind of report that we do, please consider hitting the like and subscribe. Okay, that's insane. They're like that deep. Like, okay. I did not see that coming. Like, they, they just hit the same spot over and over with these bunker busting bombs, like creating that kind of a fucking hole. Oh my god. Yeah, that makes me, that makes you think like how many things people have created deep underground that nobody knows about. Like, yeah. Okay, this has been interesting i guess like what type of escalation this is gonna have who the fuck knows like where this is gonna lead but yeah apparently it's well in real lebanon there you go and hit by iran launched a lot of missiles that went got through apparently this time 90 plus percent did not got like you know yeah but they are claiming 90 percent made through which is like come on but could you know like could be 50 percent something half of them at least so that's something but yeah right if you like my next one don't forget to subscribe and i'll see you next time